So there I was giving birth to my first child and I did die. It was very interesting. Um, I'm a, once again, I'm a little person and um, my first birth, I didn't, you know, nobody, nobody can tell exactly anybody else how it's going to be. So I just didn't think any of this was fairly odd, you know. Anyway, well, I was in there and uh, into the delivery room and they were very worried. Jason, who was my firstborn child, was seven pound 13 ounces for a first baby, was fairly heavy, etc. And uh, just, it was happening and I suddenly realised I was sitting on the high windowsill um, watching, watching it happening. And, and uh, everybody was panicking and um, it was at Nambour Hospital and they didn't want any, you know, um, birth deaths of, of mothers or children, etc. And it was a teaching hospital and, um, and I was watching as air, the bells were ringing and every nursing staff, even from the main hospital, were coming in and even the trainee nurses were coming in. They were all, it was like a huge crowd in that room. And I thought, well, this is, you know, is this how it happens? <laughs> and suddenly I turned and I looked and I was looking outside the window at the pebble dash of the hospital and this would be um, two stories high sort of thing. And I was looking at the pebble dash and then, um, then I was gone. It was like as if I was falling back and, um, to the light at the end of the tunnel. And there was this lovely um, androgynous being. For a start, I thought it was my, my grandmother because um, of the curly hair sort of thing. And, um, but it turned out to just to be, um, well, I suppose you could say an angel, uh, whatever. And, um, and it was, and I, then I thought to myself, well, I dressed him like he was a he sort of thing because he seemed to be more male than female. <laughs> uh, also realising that my grandmother was still alive so obviously it wasn't her but it could have been some other relative from way back or whatever. But anyway he, um, he, he took me and I was aware that um, while I was talking to him and he was telling me that it was okay I, I could choose to stay or not sort of thing. But he said, there's some people here, so he took me and, and there were all these people, but there was a row of different people who were um, from different cultures and who um, were obviously to guide me through my life. And then all of the other people, they were just the faces. And it went back, you know, like forever sort of thing. And in this day and age now, where I am now and where I um, seem to be photographing a lot of orbs and things, I realised that it was like orbs but the people's faces were in them. And so that the whole thing was like um, like a wall of orbs behind. But they were all people who knew me from, you know, from, from, from ever, sort of thing. But what I was most aware of was behind me was this most beautiful, loving light, and it was so bright. And I knew that if I decided to turn around, I was staying. <laughs> and I didn't because I wanted to go and raise my little son. So, uh, within that, and it was quicker than you could think. I mean, te tele that certainly brought to my mind that tele telepathy is beyond fast, beyond the speed of light, beyond the speed of thought, really. And that um, it was, anyway, before I'd even formed the thought, and I'm, I was quite aware of this, uh, that, because this registered to me as how fast this was, because I, I, um, I was so aware that, um, I was going to say, no, I'll go back. And I thought it would be like I had arrived in a, in a more um, unfurling manner sort of thing. But anyway, um, you know, uh, before I thought of it, I was back in my body. They had, you know, I was back, 
the moment I, you know, I actually formed the thought, well, I think I'll go back while I was then back. And they were, and I, then I was aware that I was being, um, you know, um, CPR, everything. It was huge. So that was my near death experience. But it did change me. It stopped all fear about anything unknown in me. And that, I'm grateful for that. <laughs>